Today I'm going to teach a message on restoration. I want to share with you what I hear God saying. Joel chapter 2 beginning in verse 12. To set the context, uh, the people of God, the children of Israel had had a harvest, but God sent a swarm of locusts, uh, caterpill caterpillars, palmer worms, canker worms that ate up the harvest. And so there wasn't any food in the barns. Uh, you know, the people were in dire straits. They were in danger of starving. And God allowed the swarm of insects to come because he wanted to get the attention of his people. And there are times that God will send things your way or allow things to come your way. Very difficult situations, and trials, tribulations, um, lack, uh, things that you had found joy in to get cut off. Uh, there are times where God will allow trials or send trials your way to get your attention. Uh, and when we sin, God will allow stuff to happen in our lives that hurt us, that cause us to experience discomfort so that we might realize how important it is and how urgent it is to let go of sin and to grab hold of him. And this is what's happened in the book of Joel. The people of God had disobeyed and as a result, God sends a swarm of insects that come to eat up the crop and to eat up the harvest and the people were uh, in dire straits. It says in Joel chapter 2 verse 12, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. What I hear God saying is that there's sin in the land and that that sin has even entered into the church. And sin is not to be trifled with. That if we do sin, we need to repent. And we need to repent with godly sorrow. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 10 through verse 11, that the sorrow of the world worketh death, but godly sorrow brings about repentance not to be repented of. When a person is truly godly sorrowful, that's when we recognize that we have sinned against God and that we have hurt God. And there's a conviction that comes to us that causes us to fast, that causes us to mourn, uh, that causes us to cry out to God for mercy. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. What I hear God saying here is that uh, it's not enough just to put on our church suit and to come and play church, to pretend holiness. God is not looking for just external changes. He wants us to surrender our hearts to him, to really do business with him, to ask his forgiveness for our sins, and to really mean it. To be heartfelt, earnest, and serious about our relationship with God. God is tired of people playing church, playing Christianity. God said, look, if you're going to be hot, be hot. If you're going to be cold, cold. But if you're lukewarm, I will spew you. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Rend your heart, God says, and not your garment. You know, rending your garment is doing an outward show of repentance, but not really meaning it inside. When you really mean it inside, there's a change that happens in your life. Repentance means to change. When you repent, you change your mind. When you repent, you change your direction. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. You know, God will allow calamity, will allow disaster and hardship to come our way. And sometimes he'll send those things or allow those things to be sent our way because of our own sinfulness. But he's also kind. He's, he's slow to anger. You know, he, if he's allowed judgment to come upon us to get our attention, and it's not the final judgment, if we repent, he'll lift the judgment. And then he'll restore back to us that which we have lost because of our own disobedience. Oh, my Lord, isn't God good? Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing. 
grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. What I hear God saying is that it's time for the preachers of God, the evangelists, the apostles, the prophets, uh, the teachers, to teach the uncompromised word of God. We need to stop watering down God's word in order to attract members and to get money into our building fund and open up our Bibles and open up our hearts and preach the uncompromised gospel of Jesus Christ. If a person is going to repent of their sins, they must be convicted of their sins. And if they're going to be convicted of their sins, then Jesus Christ must be preached. Not just man's doctrine, not just man's opinion, uh, not just a watered down version of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that makes everybody feel like they're okay with God when we're not okay, all okay with God. When Jesus said that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For Jesus said in Luke 13 and 3, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Not everybody is going to heaven. It takes a made up and surrendered heart in order for a person to be saved. The good news for us is that Jesus Christ has provided for our salvation. And through repentance and faith in Christ Jesus, we can be saved. That's why Peter on the day of Pentecost said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Zion was the hill in Jerusalem on which Jerusalem was built. One of the reasons why God chose Jerusalem as a capital for the people of Israel is that it had an elevation to it. And so when people came to it, they looked up, you see. And not only did they look up, but Jerusalem was a fortified city because it was on a hill. Blow the trumpet in Zion. God has given the people of God an elevated position. We sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but God has not put us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus to look down on people, but rather he has called, put us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus to point people to Jesus and to lift up the name of Jesus, to use that elevated position to blow the trumpet and to preach the uncompromised gospel of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When the gospel is preached, the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that if you will repent of your sins and with godly sorrow come to God and ask his forgiveness that God will cleanse you of your sins and make you a brand new person. He'll give you a new mind. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new life. You will become new when you give your life to Jesus. But newness doesn't come from playing church. Newness doesn't come from putting on airs. Newness doesn't come from trying to live a good life. Newness comes through surrender to God, admitting that we are sinful and in need of his salvation and repenting, turning from our sins, turning from our old ways and with our whole heart, turning to God. And this gospel, it needs to be preached. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. It's amazing the number of people who will gather for a fish fry, the number of people who will uh, gather for different social events of the church. But when you call for prayer, uh, you get a tenth of the people to show up. Well, God is calling the church to a solemn assembly. He's calling believers to get serious about their relationship with God and say, okay, let's get together and let's go to the altar and let's stay there until we hear from God. Let's stay there pouring out our hearts to the Lord. And if there's sin in, their, in our lives, let us repent before the Lord. Let us not pretend as though all is right when all is not right. Let's do business with God for he is gracious, he is kind. Let's stop putting on airs and hiding sins, but rather let us confess our faults one to another and pray earnestly for one another that we might be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. 
That means that not only do our old folk need to have a relationship with God, so too do our young people. God's not just for, for you once you get too old to sin. No, 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 no. All of us are in need of Jesus Christ. And so in the nursery, the gospel should be preached. In children's church and Sunday school, the gospel should be preached. In our homes, the Bible should be taught so that our young people might know what God's word says. There are all sorts of influences out in the public sphere, out in social media, where there are different beliefs that go totally contrary to God's word that are constantly being pumped into our children. The devil has many snares out there for young people. I mean, it used to be that one of the major voices that young people would hear would be the voice that they'd hear at church. But now there are so many different voices, so many different doctrines and teachings that are well thought out. The devil using falsehood to try to draw our children away from their steadfastness in Christ. I'm telling you, we are engaged in spiritual warfare and a lot of things that have happened in our country and in our world over the last two or three years are God's way of shouting out loud, wake up, pay attention to me. We can't just sit back and let the devil have our children. We've got to fast over our children and pray over our children and we need to teach our children to fast and pray so that they might have a personal relationship with God for themselves. I know what it's like to serve God as a child because I got saved when I was 11 years old and I wasn't in church when I got saved. I got saved in the privacy of my own home. I invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart to be my personal Lord and Savior. And my salvation was genuine. My salvation was real. I understood what I was doing because God revealed himself to me. And so the fast that was calling, the call to the solemn assembly was for old and young alike. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. I mean, there is a time to laugh, and then there's a time to cry. When sin has entered into the camp and is running rampant, that's not the time to smooth things over and prophesy smooth words. The priests, the ministers of God, are to weep before the Lord on behalf of the people, and yes, to repent of our own sins. Because it's not just out in, the pool, out in the pews where the wind of change is blowing, where the Holy Spirit is bringing conviction. I hear God saying that the wind of change, that his Holy Spirit is moving even in the pulpit, calling ministers of the gospel to come before him and to repent of our complacency to repent of the ways that we may have watered down God's word in order to attract new members, the ways that we may have compromised our time with him, sometimes in an attempt to please him. We get so busy that we miss God. God is calling us back to the altar, calling us back to our first love, calling us back to the freshness and newness that he has for us. God allowed the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the canker worm to come to get his people's attention that it's time to repent, time to let go of foolishness and to grab hold to him. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? You see, God is calling the priests. God is calling his people. And in the New Testament, there is a priesthood of every believer. If you are a born-again believer, you are a priest of God. Read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You are a royal priesthood that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
See, there are times where God calls you to sit in the seat of an intercessor and to stand in the gap. Lord, save my children. Lord, save my mom. Save my dad. They must be born again. I must see them in heaven, oh God. They must be born again. Save my neighbor, save my aunt, save my enemy, that he or she may know you as Lord and Savior. And if there's any sin in my life, oh God, I repent. You've allowed certain things to happen in my life for a reason. You're getting my attention, drawing me back to that understanding of how much I really need you. So forgive me, Lord, of my pride and thinking I could do it on my own. I didn't say it out loud, but my actions, they speak for themselves. Forgive me for presumption, Lord God. Forgive me of my sins. I repent and I turn to you. That's as far as we're going to go today. But understand this, that the God of all creation loves you and me too much to allow us to become complacent in sin. Sometimes he will allow waves of problems to come our way just to get our attention because he wants our attention to be drawn away from the sinful things that ensnare us to him. And when we repent, when we rend our heart, not our garment, when the people of God come together in a solemn assembly with a contrite heart, crying out to the Lord for forgiveness, crying out to the Lord for mercy, and then sitting in the seat of the intercessor, blowing the trumpet and declaring boldly that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus saves. We stand in the gap and point people to Jesus not using our elevated position um, as a fulcrum to put people down, but rather in love serving to lift people up. When we allow ourselves to be a vessel of God, God restores to us that which the canker worm and the pommel worm and the caterpillar have eaten. God's going to give you double for your trouble. He's the God of restoration. He will restore. If there's sin, that's rampant in your heart, in your life, in your mind. If disaster has come, not, and sometimes disaster can come when we are obedient, but we have to examine ourselves because, because sometimes there are disasters that come as a result of our disobedience. If disasters come as a result of your disobedience, don't stay in a state of condemnation. Repent, ask God's forgiveness. He is gracious and merciful, full of compassion. It repenteth him of evil. He will draw you back into your steadfast relationship with him, and he will restore everything that you have lost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for ministering to us today. Thank you, God, that you are the God who speaks, and I thank you for giving us ears to hear. I pray that those who are tuning in today will hear and receive your word, that we'll do serious business with you, knowing how much you love us, knowing how much you care, knowing that you only allow these things to come our way because you knew that we could withstand them by your strength. And if there are things that have come our way because of our own disobedience, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your wondrous work because you allowed it to happen, because you loved us and didn't want us to be complacent in a position of disobedience. We repent right now, asking you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we receive your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, God is standing at the door right now, knocking at the door of your heart. Won't you let him come in? If you'd like to give your heart to Jesus, please pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins. I'm very sorry. 
I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart, I pray. I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, today is the beginning of new life for you. And the years that you have lost in a sinful life, God's going to restore them back to you. And give you double for your trouble. At this time, we're going to receive our tithes, offerings, and donations. If you're writing out a check, you can write it out to the Lord's Church of Asheville. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 84, Arden, North Carolina, 28704. You're also welcome to give online at our website, www.tlcavl.com, or through the cash app, dollar sign TLCAVL321. Thank you for your giving. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. May Jesus Christ himself be very gracious unto you and grant unto you his perfect peace. And may the Lord himself, as you repent and rend your heart, not your garment, restore unto you years that have been lost for his glory.